So we chose to look into what um, Ontario was doing concerning anti-Black racism. Um, and then based on research, it's like, whoa, <laughs> there's more to be done. There's a lot to be done. Um, we learned that in 2017, uh, Ontario implemented the whole anti-racism act that aimed to actually eliminate systemic racism um, and advance racial equity, which is like what everyone wants, which is which ties into the whole um, problem with the uproar from this year during the pandemic. But like, I guess ultimately not a lot ha- had been done towards mm-hmm. that actual plan that they set out to do. So that's kind of where um, this report was birthed from. So the more we researched, the more we were like, there's more to be done. So like, mm-hmm. let's find out how to actually go about making that push towards doing something. Mm. So like the more the more answers you look for, the more questions that you found. Exactly. Exactly. This is the Public Health Insight Podcast. Season's greetings, loyal Public Health Insight listeners. My name is Gordon, and I'm here with my amazing colleagues, Ben, Linda, Will, and three special guests who will be introduced in a moment. Before we move on, it is important to note that the views expressed in this podcast are our own and do not represent any of the organizations we work for or are affiliated with. The Public Health Insight is committed to collaborating with other organizations and individuals to tackle systemic challenges that impact public health and global health. With this in mind, we have been fortunate to be involved with several projects that seek to highlight various public health issues. Alongside COVID-19, the undercurrents of anti-Black racism have risen to the surface and have demanded public attention. In this episode, we'll be focusing on key findings from a report that the Public Health Insight had an opportunity to contribute to, and it is titled, The Urgent Need for a Systems Thinking Approach to Address Anti-Black Racism in Ontario a call to action for decision makers and policymakers. The aim of this report is twofold. First, it highlights the ways in which structural anti-Black racism manifests within Ontario's institutions. And secondly, it creates actionable steps to make tangible progress towards dismantling and rebuilding systems that better meet the needs of Black communities. To discuss this incredibly important topic, we've invited three co-authors from the report. Dami Lawal is a research analyst at ETO Public Health Consultants and a recent MMA SC, Global Health Graduate from the Western University Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry. Dami is passionate about analyzing the social drivers that produce structural violence and inequities amongst BIPOC communities. Dami has leveraged her experience in graphic design, project management, policy, and data analysis to create awareness of systemic issues pertaining to racism. Danielle Rollison is a associate lawyer at Monkhouse Law and practices plaintiff side employment law. Danielle completed her JD at the University of Ottawa, and before law school, she graduated with an honors double major in law and society and Latin America and Caribbean studies from York University in 2010. While completing her JD at the University of Ottawa, Danielle was the national president of the Black Law Students Association of Canada between 2018 and 2019. She has also worked to provide safe spaces and mentorship for Black law students across the country. Lua Mihari is an alumni of Western University's Master of Public Health program at the Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry. She obtained her Honours Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Toronto in Bioethics and English. Luam conducted clinical ethics research focused on racism in the healthcare system, advanced care planning, and mental health. She has also practiced as a research assistant at the Association of Ontario Midwives, conducting a research study on the experiences of racism among Ontario BIPOC midwives and students in midwifery education and profession. Please join us in welcoming Demi, Danielle, and Luam to the Public Health Insight Podcast. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for You're having welcome. us. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. It took forever to get through those, but thanks for thanks for coming on, everyone. We're looking to, um, you know, spark some good conversation. So um, I'll get right into it. Uh, so recent events of, um, you know, high profile cases of unarmed black men, black women, you know, dying at the hands of police, you know, have sort of reopened these historical wounds um, that many black communities experience. So and we know that um, many across, you know, the entire world have been inspired uh, to be more active in anti-black racism work. And I think it's safe to say that, it, you know, what's been going on has had a lasting impact on each of us here today. 
Um, we've all made commitments to kind of move beyond that immediate selective outrage uh, to create uh, more sustained action. So um, with that in mind, let's go through some of those reasons why it was important for each of us uh, to be involved in particular with this report that we'll be touching on today. And I know not to put you on the spot, Demi, but I know you did a lot of the groundwork there. So I'm going to get things kicked off with you. Oh, wonderful. Uh, yes, again, thanks for having me on here. Um, like you said, during the global uproar um, with like George Floyd's uh, shooting and all of that, um, I was working or doing some research with Etio Public Health Consultants. And at that time, it was like, what can we do? Because we were still like doing our school program. So at that point, it's like, what can we do as global leaders? How do we get involved? Um, so I was like, it would be a good idea to actually have um, calls to action, like things that actually need to change. But first, like, let's see what's already on ground. Um, I did, I mean, I did my undergrad in Alberta, but I did, I came to Ontario for my master's. Um, so I was like, okay, let's see what Ontario has going on. Um, I had friends, other research analysts that were also interested in it. So we chose to look into what um, Ontario was doing concerning anti-Black racism. Um, and then based on research, it's like, whoa, <laughs> there's more to be done. There's a mm -hmm. lot to be done. Um, we learned that in 2017, uh, Ontario implemented the whole Anti-Racism Act that aimed to actually eliminate systemic racism um, and advance racial equity, which is like what everyone wants, which is which ties into the whole um, problem with the uproar from this year during the pandemic. But like, I guess ultimately not a lot ha had been done towards mm -hmm. that actual plan that they set out to do. So that's kind of where um, this report was birthed from. So the more we researched, the more we were like, there's more to be done. So like, mm -hmm. let's find out how to actually go about making that push towards doing something. Mm -hmm. So like the more, the more answers you look for, the more questions that you found. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah. Anyone else? Um, not, not necessarily they're just a report, but you know, anything that kind of informs your kind of passion for anti-racism work. Um, I think for me in particular, um, Going to law school, first of all, as a mature student <laughs> in 2016 mm -hmm. and seeing that uh, the mass majority of law students were not of color. Um, mm -hmm. I was the only black student in my large group of 80 students. So when I would look around that huge classroom, I would just see myself. And, um, you know, that really inspired me and galvanized me to join Balsa, which is a, a very unique and amazing um, student association, which really has the mandate to, you know, try to eliminate these systemic uh, racism within the legal profession specifically um, because of, you know, the fact that all of those barriers are put in place for us um, as Black law students and Black legal professionals are actually ingrained in the system. They're ingrained in the judicial system, they're ingrained in the law school system, and they're ingrained in society. And being a part of this report, um, although I'm not a health a care specialist, um, you know, I, I see how, how all of these um, sections of society interweave and how that all comes to impact us as Black people negatively. And I thought it was very important for me to be a part of something that actually has a call for action as opposed to the rhetoric, unfortunately, that we've seen coming from our government, even when they do acknowledge that there's anti-Black racism. Um, you know, where's the concrete change? And I wanted to be part of something that that pushes for concrete change. Um, Nitin Mohan, who actually is one of the directing minds of ATO, um, is a very close friend of mine and he reached out to me and I, I just couldn't say no. Awesome. That's good to hear. And like, you know, even though your your kind of bread and butter is in, in law, you know, public health always deploys a, you know, multi-sectoral approach to addressing these issues. So um, it's incredibly important to have a different perspective when we're tackling these systems issues. Next in line, Lawam. Yeah, so I wanted to get involved because this is an issue that's been long ignored and swept under the rug. And I feel like oftentimes there's the issue of people thinking that racism isn't really a, a real reality in, in Canada and Ontario specifically, that it's just an issue that's in the United States. And so I wanted to, um, especially during a time right now where movements like Black Lives Matter are being brought to the forefront, 
just to show that Ontario isn't any in any way free from discrimination or um, racist policies and systems and institutions. And I wanted to help shed light on those issues and really call attention to a greater need for accountability and systemic change that is actually meaningful to Black communities and helps to uh, to make changes that that we can see happen in action. Nice. So, you know, as of late, um, on that note, you know, many public health organizations um, have come out acknowledging that racism is a uh, or should be viewed as a public health issue or a public health crisis. Uh, But I wanted to focus on um, a specific type of racism um, that received a lot of, you know, public attention and it's, it's anti-black racism. So what exactly does that mean? And why do we need to talk about anti-black racism um, as something at times separate from just the broad blanket of racism? type of racism that manifests through prejudice, attitudes, implicit biases, belief systems, uh, stereotyping or discrimination. And it's specifically directed at people of Black African descent. So things like enslavement, colonization and illegal segregation of Blacks and whites uh, over time, not only in North America, but across the diaspora. Those are examples which shed light on the dark and unique history of racism for uh, Black people across the diaspora as well. So the structure and impacts of these systems are embedded in racist ideologies and they're still present in modern day society. And we see them manifesting uh, through systems like our education systems, our social systems, economic and healthcare systems as well. Um, And they impact uh, black lives through all of these systems. And I'd like to add that, you know, although we uh, specifically, I will speak as a black individual, we acknowledge that racism exists for many other people of color and minorities. However, anti-black racism is something that's specific to our community and unfortunately has not been brought to the forefront as much as it should have been, um, specifically in Ontario, because people think that, you know, there is no racism in Ontario and everybody has an equal opportunity. But when the racism is inherent and ingrained in the system, um, the negative impacts to Black people and the Black community are so prevalent um, and and they are connected to these systemic issues within our our country and within Ontario. Mm -hmm. And like, I guess in addition to all those perfectly uh, well said things, um, another thing that came to mind um, as to why it's important to have that distinction um, is that like, obviously now we have a lot of like, so like a word like BIPOC, that's like an important word um, to use to describe uh, marginalized po- populations. Um, however, it's like it forces a shared experience that is oftentimes the case, but not always the case, um, because like not all of those experiences um, are actually shared. And like, um, you know, just said in a place like Ontario or even Canada, where some people think, oh, that's only happening in the state. It's important to have that distinction. So it's like glaringly obvious to people who still think that racism does not exist, that, hey, it's happening, something needs to change. If that requires us highlighting it for the black community for you to get that, then like, that's what we're gonna do. So I think that's kind of how um, I understand um, the need for the distinction. I think the distinction is also important because It also sheds light on the fact that there needs to be community specific approaches when you're looking at solutions um, that you can't just generalize uh, solutions or action items that you would do for other racialized or people of color. So um, that's just another key point for distinction. I agree. And if I could just add to that point as well, um, you know, it's clear that, you know, racism against indigenous individuals, um, you know, First Nations peoples uh, have been highlighted and there have been specific mechanisms put into place to help those individuals build those communities, you know, alleviate structural uh, and systemic racism within those communities. And I think that, you know, that could potentially be a good jumping off point. Um, for the government in terms of, you know, having similar types of uh, provisions, protocols, policies, whatever you may call it, systems in place that are specific to the Black community by also speaking with the Black community and having their input. I think that that's just uh, similar to like consultation, right? Like there should be consultation when dealing with how to improve these, um, you know, 
systemic issues within the community right and i think it's important to to summarize it that um you know the tar- the term bipoc you know kind of forces like the shared experience like you said dami but um this is the black community coming and taking ownership of um you know what the situation is and you know advocating for their unique needs so that kind of in in making that distinction it, it doesn't take away from um the different approaches that other populations might want to use to to tackle their problems so i think that's that's my take on it as well yeah if i can just add um no i think all three of our guests have provided really great perspectives but um one specific point that kind of caught my attention was what the law mentioned about um you know having community specific interventions and solutions for these um i guess um, black canadian or black ontario populations and i think part of the the, the interesting part uh, thing about this report and just this work that we've all kind of collaborated on is you know, as public health professionals we see um, you know we understand how everything works as a system and how all these factors such as education all these social determinants have overall an impact on health population health and on equity in general and I think it's it's about time that we produce some sort of document or deliverable so that more of the public understands that you know just be um an issue let's say in our education system or in our um, social justice system not only is that a problem in that sector but it, it also in turn affects health in general and just and just bring this the the racism lens into that further um provides almost a like a clear um vision and just Hopefully, I, I hope that um, for our listeners out there, that you know, pe- uh, you, you all get a chance to ho- read through this document and just s- see some of the um, the analysis that the team has done to to highlight some of these really important issues. Yeah, thanks for that, Will. Now that we, you know, touched on, you know, the definition of anti-black racism, let's start to highlight some of those um, broader goals uh, for this report from a high level, like. What is what does it hope to achieve? What is the message, the overall message of this report, and like the intended audience of this report? High level, like you said. Um, yes, we all worked and collaborated to create a report that actively analyzes the disparities in um, education, social and economic justice, and healthcare systems that reduce the quality of life of the individuals within the Black community. Um, and then based on that analysis, um, came up with actionable steps uh, that policymakers, people who actually have the power to make these changes, uh, can take um, to make those changes. And I think for me, what was really important about this report was that it had facts and data. I mean, as a lawyer, I, I, I deal with facts. So I just wanted to, you know, have something that has concrete evidence, concrete facts, data that shows that these things do actually impact the community negatively. Um, You know, not just us expressing how we feel through emotion and through lived experience, but through data. Because when you have data, it shows that there are clear disparities and these are the reasons why they have clear disparities. And now that we know that these are the reasons why, what can we do to change these systems to make sure that these disparities are ceased, right? So for me, it was very important that this report was very well um, structured and it had data, it had numbers, it had, you know, percentages, it had uh, stats. That was very important for me. And I think that, you know, people, hopefully our goal is that people will take this seriously and see that, you know, it's not just, let's be honest, a bunch of black people or people of color just talking about how they feel and how they think uh, society has impacted them and their lived experience but like this is the true reality based off of this data that we've compiled i think that's a great point danielle and just to add to that i think a key part of having those numbers there is that it enforces accountability and that you can't ignore the issue or pretend that it doesn't exist or that it doesn't impact um, different systems and institutions in ontario but we're showing hey here's the evidence um, and we're giving you actual steps on how you can uh, really address the issue at hand. So another thing that really stood out to me 
through this report was that you acknowledge that, okay, yes, the Ontario government has an anti-Black racism strategy, but it's lacking. And you highlight that it wasn't specific enough. And so this report aims to fill that gap. And it's, I, I think it has potential for a significant impact because you're saying, okay, here's where we see the gaps and here's the evidence to back it up. We want to dialogue with you. You know, let's make your strategy better so that it actually works for the Black community. So yeah, well done. Yeah, and then adding on to that, it's important that we have the stats and numbers to obviously back up what we're saying. But the thing that I appreciate about this report is that there's context to the numbers. So for example, if you see employment rates or any other statistic, it's always in comparison to another population. So it gives an idea of what is actually happening. Yeah, exactly. And um, one of the things that you know was also apparent from the report, so we talk about how stats are important, um, where there are stats, but We also talk about the importance of where there are no stats. Um, You know, there's a lot of talk lately about, you know, the province of Ontario, even just Canada in general, not collecting a lot of, you know, race and ethnic based data on a lot of different indicators. So um, by not measuring these things and, and, you know, it's hard to evaluate um, in real numbers um, where those disparities exist. So um, that's one key thing that's apparent from the report too. Um, Here are some numbers where we were able to identify those numbers um it was not very good it didn't you know didn't have a good undertone to it um signal that signal that the problem did exist uh, or does exist and then hey it's also strange that in in these areas there's no record of any numbers at all so that needs to also be addressed as well yeah i think a recent example of that was with the Mm COVID-19 pandemic a lot of the the information and research that we had to go based off of was coming from the United States. And I know that I think there was an initiative taken by Toronto Public Health to start collecting that race data. But um, it just speaks to and, and really highlights some uh, some of those issues, including like um, child mortality rates and like maternal child health. We know that in the States, uh, Black women are three times more likely to die during childbirth. Um, but we don't have that same data available here. So that's... Uh, those are some of the things that, that we're, we're trying to address um, in terms of gaps in data and research for Black communities. Yeah, so you know, one of the things with the report is, um, you know, there's the focus on the province of Ontario, right? So Ontario is a province in Canada, um, but why not, you know, address the report from a Canadian perspective? Why focus on, on, on the provincial side of things? I think it's important to focus on Ontario. I think we have one of the highest, if not the highest population of Black um, and African Canadian um, people. Um, So I think if you can get a good, um, you know, start or a head start in in Ontario, specifically, you know, Toronto, um, where the density of Black people is very, it's, it's large, right? I think that therefore, when you get the more data that we need to collect and also, you know, more strategies and more community-based um, in, uh, initiatives that can help kind of propel um, our goal and our mandate, then therefore we can use that as like a, a template um, for the rest of the country. Um, so I think, you know, once we can kind of get it and tweak it and get it right here um, and we, we kind of canvas it out to the rest of the country, it will be, um, it will be top notch. It will be good. Yeah, and then I think, um, at least with me specifically, it was like, obviously at the time I was working on my master's in Ontario, and it's like, oh, what's Ontario up to? So we started with the, like, Ontario's actual strategic plan. And then it just, I guess just having that as a base kind of set everything off, like, okay, this, where is this, where is this, where is this? You know what? Let's go with Ontario. And, like, um, even, like, initially when we were, like, taking our collaborator, the big a big point was that it is scalable um, to other provinces uh, across um, the whole city or across the whole nation. But like Danielle said, um, it's important to start with um, somewhere and then see how that goes. Yeah, so I think an, another reason why we decided to focus on the provincial level was because we wanted a more focused approach as well. Um, oftentimes when issues like these are presented at the federal level, there might be a lack of accountability at the provincial level, like oh, the you know, thinking the scope is too large or it's not actually our responsibility to take on. Um, But we wanted these action items to really be direct and focused and show in detail how anti-Black racism manifests um, in the province and how it can actually be um, 
uh, tackled by um, and dismantled and rebuilt by institutions within the province, not just at the federal level. Yeah, I just I just wanted to add um, that, you know, some of the systems identified in this report, such as the education and the health system, are directly provincial and territorial jurisdiction. So if we are looking to actually make and suggest um, realistic and tangible change, for example, Canada doesn't have a national ministry of education. So if you're going to be talking about this or bringing up this issue to the federal government, they're going to direct you back to the provinces anyway. So I I really liked how, um, you know, in developing this report, the thought was definitely put in to to recognize which um, levels of government have the the proper jurisdiction to you know to to make meaningful change. Uh, just to add to that, I think even choosing Ontario, I mean, for one, majority of you are in Ontario, but you know, I'm in Alberta, and we don't have an anti racism act here. So I think beginning somewhere where you already have success, where there already is a bit of willingness on the part of government, I think. Yeah, it makes sense that you would choose Ontario. Even if there are areas where there's less representation of Black people, like that almost calls a need for um, attention in itself for different reasons. Just because those areas are neglected a little bit more, it's not the issue of racism isn't paid as much attention to. So although this is a starting point, it's definitely something that um, would be useful to to branch off uh, for future research. Yeah, definitely. I think that just to wrap up, Um, what everyone said there especially what will hammer the the point home too Um, when you're you're doing any kind of activism or advocacy you need to know what areas of or levels of government to target to affect change so people often think um, the only elected leader is you know the prime minister or president and everything should go towards there but the reality is a lot of you know cities local you know mayors have a lot of power in their communities and you need to know um, how these systems work in order to, you know, appropriately direct all of your energy. So um, this report, like we touched on, focuses on Ontario because those um, systems that we identified that we're, we'll touch on in the next segment could be most impacted by provincial action. So that's one of the reasons we chose that. So um, like I said, the report highlights four uh, key systems um, that have Uh, a disproportionately negative impact on black communities in Ontario. And um, the ones that were identified were the education system, the social and economic system, uh, the justice system, and the healthcare system. So uh, let's go through um, these systems one by one and summarize some some of those key findings from the report. Um, Anything that resonated with with you, um, anything external to the report from your own personal experience or knowledge, um, feel free to share. So um, we'll, we'll start by going through the education system. So um, Ontario's educational institutions um, are you know one area in which black communities continue to experience uh, s- systemic uh, racism. Um, in Ontario specifically, uh, we, all, we know that black students um, experience inequitable access to quality education and are often deprived of um, you know safe learning environments. Uh, that, that are required to ensure their success. So what are some other ways um, black students are negatively impacted as a consequence of um, these institutional racism that exists within the education system? Um, in terms of the education system, um, you know, the fact that, you know, black people are do not have access to the best education system, um, you know, they are told by guidance counselors and, and teachers who are supposed to uplift them and put them, uh, you know, allow them to have their best skills shine through and, and, and achieve the things they want to achieve. And I think um, through these systems where Black students are neglected, they just don't think that there is anything more past high school, some of them, right? Or they think that they can't aspire to be a doctor, a lawyer, a professional. They don't see those people in their lives sometimes, or they don't see themselves in those professions. And I think that you know, those things are very important. Um, and, and, you know, it's a clear result of, of, uh, of the anti-Black racism and systemic racism. And you can see it in, in all of these kinds of structures, you know, uh, UFT, for example, having one Black medical student in 2000, I believe, I think it was 18 or 19. Um, and, you know, students are trying to make systems to better help uh, the education. But I think the onus should also be on the 
the institution and the government, as opposed to the students creating these, um, you know, mechanisms to try to have black students go into, you know, higher professions or, or more specialized professions. Um, so I think that, you know, it's important to highlight the disparities in the education system um, because it kind of trickles down into employment and then it trickles down into your economic status. So it's, it's like all, in, as I said, interwoven. Um, so I think it's important to highlight that first. Yeah, just to add to that, um I think uh, a 2016 Canadian census showed that 94% of Black youth aged 50 to 25 said that they wanted to obtain a university degree, but only 60% actually felt they were capable of doing so. Um, And that's a report that I read recently, but I think it just speaks to the fact that there is a desire for academic and career growth and success, but there are so many systemic barriers that are really holding Black youth and communities back from being able to uh, attain certain goals or achievements that they'd like to make. Um, and it's it's embedded in, in the different systems that we're talking about. It's also embedded in the lack of racial representation and diversity in schools. Um, do, do Black students and Black youth see representations of themselves and their teachers or in their doctors? And, um, and why is it the case that there isn't more diversity in those institutions? And how can we really work towards making sure that that there is more diversity in the future? And it's again, it's not because we're not capable. It's because that there there's barriers that stops us from being able to do those things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess in addition to um, what Danielle and Luam just said, um, a big one was the discriminatory um, treatment by teachers or by yeah by people who work for said institution. So like um, like we mentioned earlier, it's one thing to have these like lived experiences, but the stats are also showing that, okay, black students are actually 7.4 times more likely to experience um, discriminatory treatment by teachers, um, which makes um, one question like, okay, um, like teachers know that they're in a position where like they are um, serving all forms of students. So how come there's a group of people that are suffering um, said discriminatory acts over other groups, um, which kind of ties into um, the diversity in in teaching. The what what are the teachers um, learning about these students that they have to serve? So, like for example, now I do not learn anything about like Black history or anything in school. But hey, I'm learning about how the map came about. I'm learning about who took over what. But how come I don't know about these key elements of history that actually pertain to me and other people that have the color of my skin. These are things that, you know, if I'm learning other things in school, guess what? My white friend should also learn about me if I'm trying to learn about their history. So just like little things like that. And again, we were able to see those stats that backed up like the comparison and how like it definitely was in a level um, playing field. Yeah, or the only time you hear about it is during Black History Month, it's like, Black history is really only it's it's isolated into one month of the year when really it should be integrated into the academic curriculum as a whole, the same way that Euro um, European history is. And when we do learn about our history, it's always in a negative context like slavery. And those are things that are important to to know about. But there's also many accomplishments that um, black scholars and and people have have done and, and the ways in which we built up this country into what it is. Um, along with Indigenous uh, people and um, any other races and people of color. But um, yeah, I, I think that's also a key point. And I think it's interesting that um, young Black students have to be culturally intelligent of other cultures and, and know so much and learn so much about other cultures, yet these teachers are not culturally intelligent about Black culture uh, and how, you know, how Black children may understand things, how their perspective may be different and how you need to cater to that when you're teaching them. You have to adapt and, and kind of, you know, focus on things that highlight their experiences as well as providing them with a sound education and I think that that's something that needs to be taught within the schools as well Um, a lot of diversity education uh, diversity and inclusion education should be had um, for for you know teachers um, and educators yeah those those are great points and one of the things you might hear too is our you know those kind of under the surface beliefs is 
um, you know, in regard to student suspensions, uh, for example, um, you know, black students are disproportionately suspended um, from school. And then the prevailing thought, whether people might want to acknowledge it or not, might be, well, they misbehave more or they dress differently or whatever. But the reality is um, when, he, when you look at the data um, in, you know, in our, our context and many other contexts um, with, you know, black populations is that um, for the same kind of, you know, acts, black students are suspended more. So that that argument doesn't hold any weight when two different children can do the same thing. And then one disproportionately gets punishment because of their the color of their skin. So um, that's an important thing to note too. Is um, and it goes back to what Danielle said about the numbers. When you look at the numbers like that, it kind of cuts through a lot of those arguments that are often thrown at the wall to explain these things. And I think it's also important to know that you know racial profiling doesn't only come in the form of policing. Um, racial profiling comes in the form of all of these aspects of society that we talk about. Teachers racially profile students all the time, right? Like they they just assume that it's the black student that that is misbehaving more, or that you know, um, you know, because for example, they they have bad grades just because you know of their background, where it could be maybe a mental health issue, maybe it could be just a you know a, an issue where it's like you know they have a learning disability that they need more assistance and more help, but they just don't want to provide that more assistance and help because they just. Uh, overshadow that with their biases yeah exactly and you know we we did touch on earlier that the report also presents some calls to actions to that you know decision makers and policy makers can use to start to look at these things and address some of these things so it's not um, we're not just kind of highlighting 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 the problem and then going go away so stay tuned uh, to the end of the discussion to hear a little bit more about um, what can be done and what's already being done by other organizations to address some of these things um so th that brings us nicely to the social and economic system um as one of the four key systems that were addressed in the report um we know that there's inequalities that exist in these social elements of our 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 society and these are related to various challenges associated with you know obtaining and even securing uh, opportunities for employment something that's you know considered basic when you know people have you know have different levels of education and you know and working is a part of our being and and survival and even in that very you know very important function of our of our being um, we're still seeing that there's some groups that don't have those same opportunities as other groups right so what are some negative consequences that can come from this you know gap in economic opportunity that were highlighted in the support or anything that you know of, of personally? I think in terms of home ownership, uh, redlining is key in terms of uh, Black people not getting the same access to mortgages um, or uh, opportunities for um, safe and affordable housing. Um, there is an actual, um, in Halifax, in 1848, I believe, um, there is a community called Africville and um, it existed for over a century following that. It was a thriving community of Black residents who owned businesses, they had schools in the community, they built churches, but despite the community thriving, they were given minimal to no support from the government. And in fact, were denied access to basic things like sewage systems, access to clean water um, and garbage disposal. And the government even went as far as to designate it um, an industrial land in 1947, which um, after doing so, they, they placed an infectious disease hospital in the area, a prison and a city dump in the community, which decreased the value of the homes. Um, they intentionally put things in that area to make sure that the value of that was de uh, decreased. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about Canada, mm -hmm. right? That, that almost, when you started, it almost sounds like... Um, What's that community in, in it's a T Tulsa, Ohio with the um, or Oklahoma with the Black Wall Street. It, it, but you're talking about Canada and many people seem to have this perception that, you know, Canada was where the Underground Railroad was, you know, brought people and they, you know, life was good after that. So, um, yeah, it was Halifax, Nova Scotia. Right. So it just goes to show that, mm -hmm. you know, 
we we also in Canada have a, you know dark history with indigenous groups and and the black communities as well. Yeah, people forget that we had slaves here as well. Um and you know that that history is not unique to just the United States. We also have our our own very dark history of that as well. I think also it's it's kind of like a perpetual cycle, right? Like if you look at all of these systems, the educational system, social and economic systems, justice system, healthcare system, it's like one once one of these systems fails the black community, all of these systems fail the black community. It's a trickle down effect, right? So you you know whether you start off as as coming to Canada as a black person, maybe an immigrant, um, you know, and you just end up being at the lower ranks of the economic system. You know, you have less access to better education for your children. Uh, your children may be more susceptible now to the justice system right uh, targeted profiled um, and you know if you're in a lower economic system access to healthy foods and and good health care is also affected so it's all interwoven it's all a trickle down effect they all impact each other so for an, in order for us to move forward and to provide you know um, a, an anti black racism strategy that actually will impact black canadians and black ontarians literally we have to tackle all four of these uh, systems they all have to be congruent in attack in, in in the attack because they all affect each other on on a grand scale um, no matter how you want to you know argue it um, as somebody who who may think that you know there is no racism um, in Canada or in Ontario you know Danielle I think you raise a, a good point here and the one you also touched on this in terms of um, it's not necessarily you know there's one person in government saying let's you know, discriminate against the black people, but it's like the, how all the systems um, interact together. What's the impact of these policies, these decisions? And even if a policy doesn't exist anymore, um, how did it impact generations still today? And I think that there is a lot of debate unfortunately, about whether systemic racism is even real. And um, a lot of people think it is just that, you know, violence, towards one person, like interpersonal violence. Um, so Danielle, I think you really highlighted that it's that interaction of systems and the negative impacts they have on black communities. Oftentimes we're told to just get on our feet and um, make it work. And look, my, you know, my grandfather worked hard for what he had, and but you don't understand how deep the history is and for how many centuries we've been marginalized and oppressed and not given the same opportunities. So you may have had a ladder that you're starting with at the top of the ladder, but um, black communities are, are starting at the bottom and really trying to to build from the ground up. Mm -hmm. And just like, I was just gonna add to like what Linda said earlier, um, just little, little like biases that all contribute um, to the systemic um, impact. So like just something as little as, you know, putting your name on a resume and applying for a job. Now, one of the key findings was if you put a wider looking name. So if I put not my long name, I'm 2.5 times uh, more likely to get a job. And it's like, it's just the name. Why is that affecting like your ability to go past my name and see what I've actually accomplished? And obviously it seems little. It's like, oh, try somewhere else. Eventually someone's gonna give you a chance. Well, how many times are we supposed to try somewhere else in a place that is supposed to be um, our homes or like supposed to be where we're trying to exist and just live life? Um, so it's just like those little things that, like Danielle said, trickle down to, OK, if I don't have a job, how am I going to live? How am I going to how am I going to do life um, comfortably? Like those impacts are amplified when there is intersecting identities as well. So being a black woman who's applying for a job or applying for a certain promotion and um, getting paid less. So you're dealing with being a woman or identifying with 2S LGBTQ plus communities. Um, and, and that needs to be factored in into the thinking as well in terms of different approaches for different communities because the black community isn't a monolithic group. We have several sub communities under that that need different approaches as well. Speaking of names, um, Dami, you mentioned how, you know, even applying for a job and in this report too, you highlighted having a more Anglo sounding name gives you an advantage. And, you know, in my experience, my name, my first and last name are like they're British names, 
colonialism, you know, but my family is of West African um, ancestry, but I was very aware even as a child in like grade school, grade three, grade four, I knew that I had a, a, an advantage almost, like I could fit in more because nobody knew how I looked like from seeing my name and the way I spoke, they couldn't tell. And I mm -hmm. was proud of that. I was like, yes, this is one more way where they can't tell that I'm different. And, you know, there were kids in my class who had mm -hmm. like more difficult, difficult names to pronounce in English and people would make fun of them. And I was secretly sitting there like happy that that wasn't me. And even now as an adult, when I apply for jobs, I don't worry that I will be discriminated against before an interview um because of my name and unfortunately that is a reality i agree i if i could add to your story a little bit <laughs> um i used to work at bmo at a call center and i used to uh talk to lots of different people and i think you know i'm, I'm speaking professionally um it's not like I, i'm from trinidadian background it's not like i'm gonna be i don't you know i grew up here so i don't have a heavy accent but you know when i'm with my friends i, I may have a, a little bit of an accent and i was speaking mm -hmm. to a client and they were like being very racist i do not think that they knew i was black by my name and also by my voice and it's just interesting to see how you know <laughs> you're treated you know if you had maybe an accent or a name that seemed you know diverse um that you know that impacts you and i agree it's like i feel a little bit better applying to jobs if i'm being honest because my name's pretty generic right very mm -hmm. british and uh it's not it's an unfortunate mm -hmm. thing yeah mm -hmm. it's very unfortunate yeah and speaking of um accents like you said so it's like um if we really think about it why why is someone's accent impacting their ability to execute a job so i moved from nigeria like straight up an african country right and it's like i have the name i have the accent the whole shebang so it's like there are just different barriers that you're trying to get through um just even within high school it's like obviously now there's jobs involved because like you're older and stuff but just within high school just trying to say oh i want water it's like okay if i'm going to like try and understand my teacher because i'm trying to do good it's like obviously it would be important or for you to just step in another person's shoes like okay they're trying to listen to you to do well in school how about you actually take that extra time to listen to them um so that you know they could actually do well literally yesterday i went to a hospital and like there's a lady that um obviously english wasn't her first language and she was trying to communicate that she was trying to get blood work done and just watching the way um the lady was dealing with her i was like trying to enter the ground on her behalf and it's like think about it if you were speaking another language and you were really struggling to communicate like how would you feel if someone was treating you that way like it's just these little things like if you think about it she's actually doing good like she's she's messing with like two three languages you're being proud with your one wonderful english like if you just switch this i think that these are just things that people don't think about um and just these little things like how can you make someone's life easier like just like just accept that okay you know what different people have different um aspects to their life different things that they're trying to do with to just exist with you i feel like yeah these are things that are embedded in our system it all comes with education right and and, our, and this is the first step in what we're doing is trying to educate people on what the realities are based off of fact because you know people believe in facts and numbers and if we can start the conversation with this then people will understand like to educate themselves to other cultures right you have to have compassion and understand that not everyone is like you canada is a very multifaceted diverse and multicultural country yeah i was just gonna add that we even see that um to add to what you to what you said dami sorry um, we even see that with internationally trained healthcare providers. Um, it's not just only patients, but you know, they're undermined or a patient might not want to see a specific healthcare provider because they're um, racialized or black or they have an accent and they undermine their intellect in that way as if they're not as capable as a white healthcare provider. So um, that's another way that, that we see it manifest in the healthcare system specifically. Yeah, and um, one of the things you talked about them it made me think of um you know in, in the context of indigenous people and some of the historical trauma we think about residential schools right and in this report um, we touched on you know 
you know child welfare as like a you know one of the subsets of the social and economic systems and how black communities are disadvantaged um one of the shocking things that i um uh, found from the report is that in 2011 um 8.5% of toronto's population um was considered african canadian um however um for over 40% of the children in the foster care system were african canadian so 8% 9% of the population african canadian but then in the child welfare system more than 40% are african canadian like how does that make you that 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 can't be an accident it's it's scary and i think it has a lot to do with lack of education from uh, you know social workers and and others who deal with you know um child protection and child welfare um they don't understand the community unfortunately right they're given this rule book they're given this education that's broad based and it's not specific to those communities um you see there's particular child welfare and child protection um strategies and structures within the indigenous and uh, first nations communities and it's working for them right there's consultation with their communities their community members are involved our communities are similar um our i think i think the black community whether you're from a caribbean background or an african background is very based off of kinship and you know family and community and i think without consulting them and without involving them in the child protection and child welfare system it's just not going to work you can't ship a black child off to uh, live with a white family that they know nothing about and that that family knows nothing about them um when they're you know in a foster system um there needs to be more avenues to keep that child within their community um to allow them to still feel safe and feel heard um and and you know there are lots of community um based um groups that are black community based groups who are trying to kind of infiltrate these systems and put their work and, and get their you know um put their assessment of what they think child protection should look like and i think that's very important and i know there's uh, lots of reports on that but you know after a specific year it's like where's where did those reports go what was the outcome what was the result and i think that's the problem with um the black community when we're trying to push things forward it's like we start really strong and we keep going but then something just you know the system just hits us and then we just kind of let it dissipate um and i think you know when with more reports like this and with people actually saying like we need to keep pushing for these things to be implemented in our society then you know change will actually occur and we also need to be given a seat at the table um to be able to have our voices heard because there are a lot of grassroots and community organizations that have been doing this work endlessly um but just you know aren't given the right resources or access to the right um meetings that where they can address these issues and actually be heard and um there's proper leadership there that will allow for change or actually push for change so um yeah i think that's important too In this episode, we shared some key findings from our collaborative report titled The Urgent Need for a Systems Thinking Approach to Address Anti-Black Racism in Ontario, a call to action for decision makers and policy makers. Stay tuned for part two of our discussion as we continue to dissect institutional racism. Thank you for listening to the Public Health Insight Podcast, your go-to space for informative conversations, inspiring community action. If you enjoy our content and would like to stay up to date, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. To learn more about our community initiatives and how you can support us, visit our website at thepublichealthinsight.com. Join the PHI community and let's make public health viral. Thank you.